want to talk a little bit about this Rams Packers game um, because although anything can happen, the narrative that is out there right now that seems to think that this is possibly or should be in the Rams' favor, I think, is a little bit silly. So um, if you already listened to the Packernet podcast, you've heard all of this stuff already. So feel free, unless you want to just listen to it again, because it makes you happy, that's fine. Uh, but feel free to, to pass this one on by. If you don't listen to the podcast, please start listening to the podcast. But I just want to go over a couple points that point to why, if you expect the Rams to win, you're not thinking properly. Here we go. So the, the first point is that Vegas sees this very heavily in the Packers' favor. And, and I, I, I want to clarify what exactly I mean by that. Because usually people see against the spread and they're like, yeah, that, whatever, that happens. All the people beat the, the, the Rams were underdogs last week and they won. This is six and a half points. And I, I don't want to be uh, flippant about what that means and what, what Vegas means when they say six and a half points. For, for example, the Rams in the McVay era have never once beaten a spread while being this big of underdogs. Never. Now, it's a small sample size. Never. The Packers, on the other hand, in the uh, Matt LaFleur era, have never lost a game when Vegas has given them this good of odds, ever. So, again, we can kind of be flipping about it and say, okay, well, you know, Vegas likes it, but I still think the Rams are, are probably a better team. I still think it's a good matchup, blah, blah, blah. This is, this is big. Six and a half points is big. In fact, um, I mentioned it's a small sample size with the, um, with the Rams in the McVay era. And you could see that as being skewed, right? Because technically the answer is two times. Two times ever have they been uh, six-point underdogs or worse. They lost both of those games. Well, it's a small sample size. It doesn't mean anything. No, it does mean something. The fact that McVeigh has only been this big an underdog once, in other words, a bigger underdog once, and that was against the San Francisco 49ers in 2019, that's it. In other words, according to Vegas, this is the second hardest matchup Sean McVeigh has ever had ever as a head coach. That's what Vegas is trying to tell you. I think that's substantial. Moving on. The second thing, and I think this is one of the most upsetting, is the, um, well, let, let me put it this way. The idea that this is a very good offense against a very good defense is true. Um, I don't know that you can put a blanket statement on best whatever. It depends how you break things down. The Packers do have for the season the number one offense. The Rams do have for the season the number one defense. So I think I'm okay with that. The problem is the the inverse narrative that it's a pretty bad offense against a pretty bad defense. That's false. The Packers defense is one of the best in the NFL at this point in time. Again, if you look at over the course of the season, that's not true, but teams aren't the same as they are in week one as they are in week 16. So if you look at since the second half or even the last quarter, which kind of shows you what teams are morphing into, you get a different picture. For example, a lot of teams, Buffalo, Tampa, Green Bay, have really taken those weaknesses and turned them into strengths and have good uh, phases on offense and defense. The Saints, good on offense and defense. The Rams are kind of by themselves right now is not having that. Just to give you an idea of a couple little points here. Number one, the last quarter of the season, the last four weeks, the Seattle Seahawks actually had the number one defense. They're gone. Tampa, number two. The Rams are number three. The Packers are number five. So we're looking at a top offense against a top defense and a bottom 10 offense against a top five defense. Now, again, you can split it up any way you want, but let me give you a couple bit more pieces of information about this Packers defense just to give you an idea that it's not necessarily a fluke. For example, one of the teams they faced was the Tennessee Titans. They were supposed to lose that game. Similar narrative. Well, they're going to run all over them. They can't stop the run, blah, blah, blah. Ram the Titans scored um, 14 points. The number one corner in the NFL is not Jalen Ramsey. His name is Jair Alexander. That's point number one. In the second half of the season, again, not the first half, not the entire season, but if you start at, at the second half of the season and look through the end of the season via PFF, the number one safety in the NFL is Adrian Amos. The number two safety is Darnell Savage. They have the number one, number two safeties and the number one corner. On top of that, Zadarius Smith is still a pass rusher. Um, uh, blanking on his name now, the other young pass rusher. What in the world is going on right now in my brain? Rashawn Gary, thank you very much 
has had back-to-back -back elite games. Now, well, it's just two games, whatever. Kind of the same thing happened with Savage, though. He had a good game, and it was like that was a it was one of the best, highest grades PFF gave all season. But it's like, yeah, but guys have good games once in a while. But it started to become more consistent, and now it's been a what eight game sample size when we talk second half of the season, where we have a pretty clear picture. No, this guy's actually figured it out. He's playing really good football. This is back to back games, not just good, but elite. It's very possible that a very good football player has kind of just figured it out a little bit toward the end of the season. So. Again, I, I don't want to miss the narrative, and I'm not saying the Packers are as good of a defense. I'm not saying they're better than the Rams' defense. I'm saying it is not true that it's the best offense and best defense against a bad offense and a bad defense. It is a elite offense against an elite defense and a terrible offense against a really, really good defense. That's the actual scenario that you're dealing with right now. The next bit of information is the LA Rams on the road. The Rams have not been very good on the road. If you look back since the Sean McVay era, they're, I, I want to say, 11 of 36, whatever that comes out to. So, so they, you know, two-thirds of their games or whatever they win on the road, on the road. so not that bad. If you look back at 2019, starting last year, they're about 500. In fact, their record specifically is eight wins out of 17 games, so eight wins, nine losses, would it be, I think? Not great. And that's carried over into this year. I think they're one game up, whatever that may be. Four losses, five wins. I don't know, something to that effect. I don't want to look it up right now. The Packers, conversely, in uh, since 2019, which is all of Sean Mc, or, uh, Matt LaFleur's tenure. I just did an hour and 10 minute long podcast. My brain's a little bit fried. Um, 17 games at home, two losses. Two losses. Clearly, that's in the Packers' favor. So, so again, we're stacking these things, right? We're looking at all these things combined and saying, this is not going well. The Rams used to be pretty good on the road. They're not good on the road right now. They're a team that has winning records, but on the road, they're about 500. Um, and, and a lot of those games are divisional games, right? Which is kind of barely even on the road, right? Those are weird kind of games. You talk about them actually traveling places, they're not very good, and the Packers very, very, very rarely lose at home. Again, Philadelphia in 2019, Minnesota this year in um, 2020 was the only game they lost at home this entire year. Uh, they lost those games by six points and seven points, so they were both fairly close games. Um, they don't lose at home in general. That doesn't even include the weather, which is what we'll talk about next. The next factor is the weather itself. Um, it's not going to be as cold as, as we were all kind of hoping, uh, but even as a Packer fan, I thought maybe the cold weather thing was a little bit of an exaggeration. It's absolutely not. Um, I actually went through in a separate episode and looked at some of the other teams and their records in cold weather. Um, the Bears and the Packers actually do very well in cold weather as far as their record. Um, I was when it's colder there's less games so it's easier to kind of go through the data as far as how well Aaron Rodgers plays and all that there's like 60 games that the Packers have played in Aaron Rodgers time that have been 35 degrees or less um, but still if you look at Jared Goff because it's supposed to be about 35 degrees 35 degrees or less his record is one and one so you look at it and go, okay well there's no information there no that's the team Let's look at Jared Goff and what he did. So the first game, which was a loss, was in Chicago. It was 15 to 6 was the score. Jared Goff was 20 of 44, which is horrendous, for 184 yards, zero touchdowns, four interceptions. So that's not great. Then you have the win over the Denver Broncos. Obviously, this was in Denver, cold weather game. The Rams won 23 to 20. So it's not all bad, right? Well, let's take a look at Jared Goff. 14 of 28, 50%. That's garbage. 201 yards, zero touchdowns, one interception. So he's at, I, I believe, because I combined these at some point in the past, like 47% completion percentage for what? Maybe 400 ish yards, zero touchdowns, and four five interceptions I think in cold weather that's terrible so the Rams offense is a lot worse than it was in the past um Jared Goff's hand is busted up and we're playing in cold weather in Lambeau Field against by the way I don't know if I mentioned it before or not but a very good defense I don't know where this information is coming from that that 
this is the path the Rams wanted to take. Like, this was the easier path. We'll just get this out of the way, and then we got to figure out how we're going to beat Tampa. No, dude, you're not getting out of this one. I'm sorry. This matchup sucks for you. The final issue that you're going to have is going to be schematic. Um, there's offensively and defensively things that the Rams don't want to see. The, the most obvious thing is generally the Rams are going to be better against teams that hold on to the ball. Seattle Seahawks are a great example of that. Russell Wilson holds on to the ball longer than just about any quarterback in the NFL. Obviously, that's problematic because it, it gives Aaron Donald more time to get to the quarterback. Aaron Rodgers gets the ball out of his hand incredibly quickly. It didn't always used to be that way, but under this new system... The system is designed to be quick, right? It's it's not that there aren't slower, more long-developing type plays involved like every offense has, but generally speaking, this is not the offense that's going to sit in the pocket and wait. Aaron Rodgers has been sacked or pressured less than just about any quarterback in football. I don't know if that's still the fact, so I'll say just about, just as a caveat. But he's been under very little pressure all season, and it's not because this is the best offensive line he's had. Talent-wise, it's not. It's the scheme itself, largely, as well as having some good offensive linemen. For example, Corey Lindsley, best center in football right now. Um, but it's it's that coupled with the scheme, which is run game reliant, um, as well as a lot of a lot of play action and quick passes. They like to get the ball out of their hand very quickly. Another schematic issue for the defense is that one of the weaknesses is the edges. You don't have corners that like to tackle, which is normal, and you also don't really have the best edge guys in the world, and, and the way teams have beaten the Rams, including the Jets, by the way, which was a massive upset, was largely by attacking the edges. That's what the Packers like to do. They run outside zone. They get their guys to the outside, and they run around you, and they actually have, which sounds stupid, but it's problematic for the Rams. They actually have tight ends and wide receivers that they emphasize blocking. They have the best blocking wide receivers in football. Sounds dumb until you realize the goal is going to be to get to the outside, which the Rams don't want to do, and they're going to have big, massive Alan Lazard, who's basically a tight end type wide receivers, blocking guys like Jalen Ramsey out of the stadium while we have, you know, possibly 250-pound A.J. Dillon rumbling around the edge. It just, it creates a problem. And again, it's not that the Rams can't handle it. They're a good defense. It's just that they... The Packers play a specific style of football that is against what it is you want to do. Um, and so on the flip side, it's not necessarily the case. Obviously, the Rams are a talented run team, good run blocking and all that. The, the biggest issue is going to be that the way that the Packers play football, they're going to play you probably very similar to how they did against the Titans, which is to say, and it sounds weird, but the, the strategy is largely going to be they're going to let you run. Not let you run for 500 yards, but if you're if you're going to sit there and just try to run the ball and win the game against Aaron Rodgers, best of luck. Bottom line, it's really not going to work. You're going to have to start throwing at some point because you can't just run the ball and dink and dunk your way down the field all along. And the Packers have proved that. They proved that against the Titans and the Bears, who are two teams that don't want to throw. They want to run, 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 run. Right, And so when you have a team like, for example, the, the Tennessee Titans, they want to run the ball and then scare you so that you come up to the line of scrimmage and then we kill you with play action. The Packers never bid on it. They're like, no, that's fine. You go ahead and run. We're not We're not going to bite on it. We're going to stay in, in nickel and dime coverage and not going to let you throw. So now you get yourself in a situation where you don't get to get play action and get these easy little tosses out there because the Packers aren't biting on it. You actually have to stand back in the pocket on third and long because you know eventually you're going to get into a third and six or something, and you're going to have to play big boy quarterback, stand in the pocket with no deception, no decoys, no confusion, and just throw a ball to a guy that's, that's hopefully getting open. And the problem with Tennessee is that the offensive line, as good as they were at run blocking, they're not very good pass blockers, and that's exactly what the Rams' offensive line is. Great run blockers, kind of bad pass blockers. Not necessarily your tackles, but the interior especially, and maybe a little bit your right tackle. Um, that's problematic. And so that's what the Packers are going to do. They're going to let you play stupid ball. right? If you just, oh, we're going to run the ball. It's five yards. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Okay, first down there. Yeah, first down there. For Eventually... There's a mistake. One incompletion ruins everything. Because now a four-yard run doesn't mean as much. Right? If you go four yards, four yards, four yards, it's a first down. If it's four yards and then incomplete, what is it? It's third and six. That's all the Packers are going to do. They're going to let you run. That's not to say that they're not going to put snacks out there and, and, and not try to stop you. 
they're not going to align their defense in such a way where they stack the box and play scared of your run game. They're going to say, if you want to try to take the little stuff, they're going to give it to you. It's frustrating for Packer fans. The point is, though, it works. The point is, you're going to try to dink and dunk your way down there. Eventually, you're going to make a mistake, and you're not going to end up getting the points at the end of this. And that's what the Packers defense has been proving over these last several weeks. Eventually, if you want to beat this offense, you're going to have to man up spread out your offense and throw the ball and Jared Goff in cold weather against this defense is not going to be able to do that. So that's the problem. It's a bad matchup. It's a bad environment. It's a bad everything for the Rams. And again, I'm not saying the Rams can't win. This is a very, very good defense. Defense wins championships. Uh, the Packers could come out flat. You know, a lot of things could happen. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the Rams. I'm just trying to correct the record a little bit. The Packers are massive favorites for a reason, because every little thing that you look at along the way says Packers. This is Packers, advantage Packers, advantage Packers, all the way along the line. So anything could happen, but the Packers are the favorites in this game for a very, very good reason. They are a very good team, somehow still underrated. Somehow the narrative that they're a terrible defense is still floating out there, despite the fact that that has been blown completely out of the water. Despite all these things, they're not getting the respect they deserve. And um, this is the fact of the matter is this is, along with a few others, Buffalo, Tampa, whatever, one of the hottest teams in football right now in terms of everything is starting to come together and click just right. The offense is on fire. The defense has become one of the best in football. That's what the Rams are up against. Great football team. I wish you the best of luck next year, but it's going to be a tough one. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. Thank you.